Just perhaps time travel is possible for advanced civilizations. Paul Amadeus Dinoch would never have imagined himself as a famous writer or a man who would travel to the future. But in a surprising twist of fate, he ended up doing both. From being a Swiss-Austrian teacher with bad health to being a time traveler, Dinoch journeyed to the year 3906 and learned about the destruction and rebirth of the world. And the secrets he revealed about the future for our species is truly terrifying. Join us as we unravel the mysteries of a travel forward in time to the year 3906, the man from the future. Paul Amadeus Dinoch was an ordinary Swiss-Austri teacher who had both Swiss and Austrian origins, as his father was a German-speaking Swiss and his mother was an Austrian from Salzburg. The teacher had lived a quiet life until the day his life changed forever. It all began in 1921 in Geneva, when Paul Amadeus Dinoch fell into a coma because of a rare illness called lethargic encephalitis. He stayed unconscious in a hospital for over a year, and when he finally woke up, he started writing in his diary the shocking details of what happened during his coma. The teacher wrote about how his soul had left his body to enter that of another person, a scientist named Andreas Northam, who lived in the year 3906 AD. Even Dinoch was left confused by what had happened, but he was sure that he had lived in another time. So after recovering from the illness, he moved to Greece in the fall of 1922, hoping the nice weather and new environment would help him start afresh. While in Greece, Paul Amadeus Dinoch taught French and German to make some money and then bonded with his student, George Papahatsis. Before he left, he gave hundreds of pages of handwritten notes to his favorite language student, Georgios Papahatsis. In 1924, Paul Amadeus Dinoch was battling tuberculosis and longing to go back to his homeland in Switzerland. Because his health was getting worse, he gave his most prized possession, his diary, to his favorite student, Georgios Papahatsis. Dinoch hoped Papahatsis could learn German better by translating these notes. They said goodbye, not knowing it would be their last time seeing each other. As Papahatsis started translating, he found surprising things in the notes. They talked about a predicted nuclear war, people going to Mars, a worldwide government being formed, and ideas about flying cars, holograms, and meeting aliens. At first, Papahatsis thought it was all made-up stories, but as he read more, he realized it was Dinoch's diary that told the extraordinary story of his journey through time. Dinoch's Journey Through Time Dinoch was believed to have had encephalitis lethargica, a weird brain illness where the immune system reacts to overworked neurons. The first time he had an episode, he fell into a lethargic sleep that lasted for 15 minutes. Then, in May 1921, during one of Dinoch's language classes at his college, he started feeling dizzy. Because of his history of health problems, Dinoch ended up in the hospital with a high fever. But as he was being attended to, he suddenly became unconscious. During these times, Dinoch felt like there were people around him, but he was too weak to talk to them effectively. After waking up, he found himself in a strange hospital room with people wearing odd clothes and speaking a language he didn't know. Dinoch, who taught languages, recognized a few words similar to English and Swedish. He tried to talk to them, but they didn't understand. Finally, a doctor named Dr. Hahn, also a famous physicist, tried to talk to him in broken German, calling him Andreas Northam. Dinoch was confused because he didn't know anyone named Andreas Northam. When shown a mirror, he saw a face he didn't recognize, which made him very upset. He wondered if he was dead or going through something mentally. Feeling desperate, Dinoch said he was just a simple language teacher from Switzerland and didn't understand what was happening. When he mentioned Switzerland, the doctors reacted and asked him what year it was. He confidently said it was 1922, which shocked everyone in the room. But then an older doctor told him it was actually the year 3906. Dinoch, doubtful and not believing what he was hearing, looked out the window and saw a strange scene. There were tall buildings reaching up into the clouds and cars zooming around in the air as if gravity didn't matter. This weird sight made Dinoch feel so overwhelmed that he passed out again. After three days of careful watching, Dinoch started to get better. He was strong enough to walk around. He described his surroundings vividly, talking about walls made of crystal that showed a beautiful view and things made of warm, glowing metal in soft colors. He was led to a big room where he met two people wearing white robes. At first, Dinoch thought that the doctors might be priests or kings, but they were actually called electors. They seemed very wise and important, but up until that moment, 
The doctors thought Dinox's strange experiences were because he hit his head, and they didn't believe his story about coming from a long time ago. But after listening to his story for a while, they started to believe Dinox's incredible tale. The electors knew about something rare called a consciousness shift. It's when someone's mind or soul moves into another person's body. They guessed that during an accident involving a man named Andreas Northam, Dinox's mind went into Northam's body. Northam had been dead for 15 minutes, but doctors cooled his brain and got his heart going again. That's when Dinox's mind switched with Northam's, sending Dinox 2,000 years into the future. The electors believe that our minds exist everywhere in time and space all at once, and that it was possible that a mind changes body. In an attempt to fully understand what was happening, the electors invited a man named Stefan into the picture. Stefan and Andreas Northam were really good friends, and his job is to help Northam remember who he is so they can switch back by helping Paul Dinoch live Northam's life and teaching Dinoch about how things were done in that time. Stefan agreed to come over every day to teach Dinoch about modern stuff, but Dinoch, who had been living in the future for two weeks, was more interested in the past, especially since in the 1920s he was always exhausted, but in the future, he never sleeps. Even though Dinoch spends nights reading and learning the new language, he never gets tired. He was even given a cool gadget called the Oregon Schwager to learn. This device was like a small device with moving pictures and sounds, kind of like an iPad but fancier. The doctors instructed Dinoch that he could learn about anything from the past, but he couldn't learn too much about the 20th century because they were worried that he might change history. Translating Dinoch's Diary George Papahatsis slowly translated Dinoch's notes for over 14 years, from 1926 to 1940. He worked on them during his free time and summer breaks. Even though he wasn't perfect in German, he still managed to do it, but his efforts were greatly slowed down by World War II and the Greek Civil War. One Christmas Eve in 1944, while Papahatsis was staying with his friends at a house where Greek soldiers were also staying, they saw Dinoch's notes, written in German, and then took them because they found the notes suspicious. Papahatsis pleaded with them, saying that he was not a spy and that they should return his notes, but they promised to return them after checking them, but they never did. Luckily, Papahatsis had already finished the translation by then. He tried to find out more about Dienach by visiting Zurich 12 times between 1952 and 1966, but he couldn't find any information about him, not even his family or friends. Dienach, who might have fought for Germany in World War I, probably used a different name in Greece, a country that fought against Germany. After World War II and the Greek Civil War, Papahatsis shared the translated diary with some of his friends. They were Masons, Theosophists, Theology Professors, and two anti-Nazi Germans. Once they realized the importance of the diary, it was kept within a small group of philosophers and in the Tectonic Lodge, of which Papahatsis was a member. The Masons took the book very seriously making efforts to ensure that the information in the book did not spread widely. They thought the book was like a holy text, full of wisdom about the future of humanity and that it should only be kept for a select few. After many arguments, George Papahatsis decided to publish Dinoch's diary when Greece was going through the toughest time of its seven-year dictatorship in 1972. Some religious groups strongly opposed the book, calling it heretical, and the fall of the dictatorship a year later led to the first edition being forgotten. People were too caught up in the intense and violent present to care about the future. The language of Dinoch's notes was tough, and the writing style was rough. It mixed elements of his past with his experiences of the future, making the diary even more challenging to understand. Only a few people had the time, patience, and knowledge to decode the secret knowledge hidden within nearly 1,000 pages. Another edition was released in Greece in 1979, but once again, the book vanished, hardly mentioned except by a few who knew of its existence. After years of silence, Papahatsis passed away, and his family didn't want to continue his work. Papahatsis was just a student when he received Dinoch's diary, but he later became a highly respected figure of his time, serving as vice president of the European movement called the National Council of Greece, a founding member of the Greek Philosophical Society and a professor of philosophy and culture. 22 years after Papahatsis' death, a senior member of the Masonic Lodge in Greece, Radamanthus Anastasakis, decided to publish the diary in its original form, but on a small scale. Radamanthus, 
Anastasakis removed sentimentalities that he believed held Papahatsis back from doing more than a direct translation of his teacher's holy writings, because he felt that nearly a century after the original was written, it was essential to make it understandable for a 21st century reader. He made sure not to change any of the content, but filtered out irrelevant notes about Dinoch's early life, focusing on Dinoch's future experiences, using simpler language, and filling in the gaps in the time traveler's narration in the book, Chronicles from the Future. Chronicles from the Future. As written under Radamanthus Anastasakis' account, Dinoch described a fascinating future where devastation turns into a perfect world of peace and joy. Dinoch said that from 2000 to 2300, things will be really tough for humanity. The world would be overpopulated. There would be hunger, drought, and never-ending wars over land and resources. This will lead to disasters like famines and environmental problems. Countries will race to build more and more nuclear weapons, making things even scarier. As a result, there won't be much food left because fertile lands will be ruined by radiation from bombs. Dinoch also predicted that by 2100, people will start living on Mars. Around 20 million people will move there to make a new home. But sadly, in 2265, a huge natural disaster will happen on Mars, killing everyone there. After that, no one will try to leave Earth again. But what happened on Mars will not be the end of our troubles. Dinoch said that even though many leaders will try to calm things down, there will be a big war all over the world in 2309. A big nuclear war hits Europe, wrecking most of it. Only the Baltic and Scandinavian countries will come out of it okay, and this might be why they speak a mix of English and Scandinavian there. It'll be chaos for the next 80 years, and lots of people and things will be destroyed. Some people will survive, though. By 2396, all the countries left will join together to make one big government for the whole world called Redst, and this will mark the end of old times and the start of new ones. But this government will be shady, as it will be run by the rich and powerful. Even though some countries will not be in support of this government and will want to keep their own ways, Red Sea will stick around for about 200 years. Then things changed. Scientists, philosophers, and doctors would snatch power from politicians and business people for the top jobs, making things more fair and sensible. But in 2823, a leader named Toruhild comes up with a new way of governing society. Over the next 300 years, things worked differently than they do now. Instead of less than enough or more than enough, Toruhild's system made sure everyone had what they needed. This big change made people want to help each other more. Education and fun things to do were shared by everyone around the world. Money didn't matter anymore. Art and science became more important. One could decide to work just like Andreas Northam or choose not to do anything after the compulsory two years of service. Paul Dinak also mentions something called the needlework or needlework that will take place. In this future, people's brains will be transformed, which will make them feel super happy, not scared of dying, and not worried about regular stuff. However, the overwhelming feelings of joy, peace, and fearlessness will eventually catch up with them and eventually lead to their deaths. This is just like when someone does not feel any pain for years, and then, all of a sudden, they suddenly feel an excruciating pin that will lead to death. In the year 3906, people's brains were different from how they are now, aiming for a perfect future. Laws didn't matter much anymore, because everyone was happy to work together for the greater good. Being selfish was seen as something old-fashioned and not clever. People in 3909 couldn't even imagine being selfish like some people are today. Paul Dianak, along with his friend Stefan, watched aliens together. Stefan told them that humans had met aliens many times before, and it was always okay. People in the future knew there were smart beings living in the solar system and around the galaxy. Strangely, these beings didn't really want to talk to us. They liked watching from far away. Sometimes these aliens would step in, especially during important times like fights. Paul really liked spending time with a woman named Anna, but she had to leave. Before she went, they promised to see each other again. Paul hoped for a sign from Anna after she left, but it never came. He missed her a lot and wished things had turned out differently. Is time travel real? The concept of time travel has been in existence for thousands of years. Whether it is real or a myth, one can't tell, but one thing that is certain is that our present knowledge of science and time does not support the theory of time travel. Ancient stories talk about people jumping ahead in time. In Hindu stories, there's King Raivata Kakudmi who goes to heaven to meet the creator, Brahma. 
When he comes back to Earth, he finds out that a lot of time has passed. In Buddhist stories, there's Kumara Kasapa, one of Buddha's top students, who tells a guy named Piyasi that time in heaven moves differently than on Earth. Then there's the Japanese tale of Urashima Taro, which tells about a fisherman named Urashima no Ko. He visits an underwater palace and comes back home after three days. But when he gets back, 300 years have gone by. His house is ruined and his family is gone. In Jewish stories, there's Honi Ha Ma'agal, a scholar from a long time ago. He falls asleep for 70 years and when he wakes up, nobody he knows is around. Nobody believes him when he says who he is. Also in Islam, there's a story in the Quran about the seven sleepers. These were young men who believed in Allah and were running away from people who didn't like their beliefs. They found safety in a cave and fell asleep. While they slept, Allah kept them safe for many years. When they woke up, this story, mentioned in the Quran's Surah Al-Kaf, talks about how Allah protected them and stopped time for them. There is a similar story in Christianity. In this story, a group of young men were running away from being punished by the Romans because they believed in one God. Back then, Rome was a place where many gods were worshipped. In another story from Islam, there's a man named Uzair, sometimes thought to be the same person as the biblical Ezra. He felt really sad when he saw Jerusalem being destroyed by the Babylonians. People say that God took his soul and then brought him back to life after the city was rebuilt. When he came back to his hometown, nobody recognized him, not even his family and friends. Only an old maid, who used to be blind, recognized him because she got her sight back when he prayed for her. During this time, Uzair also met his son. Even though his son had grown much older than him, he still knew that Uzair was his father. In this modern world, one of the earliest stories about time travel using a machine is The Clock That Went Backward by Edward Page Mitchell, which was published in the New York Sun in 1881. Even though the way time travel works in this story seems fictional, it still triggered a wave of controversies, as in the novel, there's a strange clock that, when wound up, starts running in reverse and takes people nearby back in time. The author doesn't explain where the clock came from or how it works. Another story, El Anacronopete by Enrique Gaspar y Rimbaud from 1887, might actually be the first to feature a machine specifically designed for time travel. But then, H.G. Early Times' famous novel, The Time Machine, published in 1895, made the idea of time travel using a mechanical device more popular. Another man said to have traveled through time. On April 23, 2006, the police arrested a man in his late 20s to early 30s because he was acting strange. The young man seemed very confused and kept asking what year it was. When the police interrogated him, he said his name was Sergei Ponomarenko, and until just moments ago, he believed it was still 1958. Confused by the young man's claims, the police asked for his identification, and they were surprised by what he handed over. The ID Sergei gave them was an old Soviet Union ID card. The ID was at least 15 years old, because Ukraine had become independent after the Soviet Union broke up in 1991. Another strange thing was that, looking at the ID, the police saw that the man in front of them, Sergei Ponomarenko, matched the photo on the card. But they also noticed he was dressed oddly. Instead of modern clothes, Sergei was wearing old-fashioned clothes from the 1950s and had a vintage film camera around his neck. The police thought he might be crazy and took him to a psychiatric clinic in Kyiv. There, Dr. Pablo Kutrykov examined him on April 23, 2006. In the video of the session, Sergei said his name was Sergei Valentinovich Ponomarenko and that he was born in Kyiv on June 16, 1932. And that sounded impossible because he didn't look like a 74-year-old man. When asked how old he was, Sergei only said he was 25. He told the doctor that the last thing he remembered was walking in Kyiv with his fiancée, Valentina Kurish, and taking a picture with his camera. After that, he saw something strange in the sky. Sergei described the strange thing he saw as being shaped like a bell and said it was flying in a weird way. He told the doctor that he thought he could see it better if he took a picture. And suddenly, he was in this time. Now this might sound like a made-up story, but Sergei said he had proof. To check if Sergei was imagining things or if he really did time travel after snapping a photo of a UFO, Dr. Kutrykov had the pictures developed. Sergei used an old camera, so the film couldn't be developed using modern methods. 
A photography expert was brought in to help. When the expert got the film, he was surprised, as films like that were last made in the 1970s and this one was still in good condition after the time gap. The expert developed the pictures and indeed they were of Kyiv from the 1950s. A photo of a woman around Sergei's age and one of Sergei wearing the same clothes he had on during the interview. But the most amazing one was of a bell-shaped UFO in the sky, just like Sergei had said. The new discovery shocked the police, so they retained Sergei in the clinic, making sure he did not escape. And on April 25, 2006, the time traveled had another session with Dr. Kutrikov and this time they talked about the pictures. When the doctor showed Sergei the pictures, he basically said that he told the doctor so and he still did not understand what the object was or how he got there. After they finished talking, Sergei was caught on security cameras going into his room at the clinic, but he was never seen leaving. There were bars on the windows, so he couldn't have escaped. Now, the police had to find a missing person. They checked old records from the Soviet Union and confirmed that there was indeed a man named Sergei Valentinovich Ponomarenko from Kyiv. But the records showed that Sergei Ponomarenko was reported missing in 1960. The police took a photo of Sergei's fiance, Valentina Krish, and went to ask her about the situation. They found Valentina, who was an old woman in her 70s, and she told them that her fiance, Sergei Ponomarenko, had disappeared for a few days back in 1958, but he eventually came back. Valentina said that when he returned, he could somehow see into the future. He even appeared on national TV and told people about things like cell phones, which didn't exist back then. Valentina showed the officers a photo that she claimed was sent by Pono Marenko, dated 2050, showing an older-looking Sergei and futuristic buildings in Kyiv. The last time Valentina saw him was in 1970 when he disappeared again and never came back. It seemed like Sergei's last trip through time was a one-way journey. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.